Hello and welcome back to another episode of You Want to Do What with Dan and Julie. Today we've got Mark Thompson on, who is a scientific author and broadcaster. Hi Mark, how are you? Hello there, I'm very well, thank you. Yourselves? All good. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, so do you want to tell everyone a little bit about what you actually do, Mark? Yes, you know, it's, it's very difficult. You know, you, you, your, your sort of opening gambit of science broadcaster and author is, is spot on. Um, my, my sort of, my, I, I have no such thing as a, as a regular day. Um, things can, I can go from weeks of being really, really busy to re- weeks which can be very, very quiet. And it's, it, it's so, so I guess for a bit of background, I started off um, in media when I started doing some work for The One Show many years ago now. I was asked, present some uh, astronomy stargazing films for the one show which I, I, probably too many years ago now to to, to think about uh, <laughs> and from that I got engaged to present stargazing live with Brian Cox and Dara Brian on BBC that was uh, started a few years ago and since then my, my sort of career has has turned into one of being a science popularizer or science broadcaster and author so I've I've, I've done some work on TV and I now do um, bits and pieces on Good Morning Britain uh, and other news uh, channels. Uh, I also write science books and uh, astronomy books. I've now got, I think, nine books under my belt. Uh, and, and until recently, I was touring my spectacular science show around theatres around the UK and having lots of fun. Um, uh, and also since, since lockdown, which which caused um, theatres to be uh, unavailable, um, done my own podcast which is quite fun called the pocket astronomer where i i aim to sort of guide people around the night sky um and it's almost like having me in your pocket so as a scientific broadcaster and author it's 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 a mixed bag um and no 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 one day is the same as the next one which is quite you know it's quite nice um but it does mean you kind of never know where you are from one day to the next (laughs) so where did your um obviously astronomy and science is what your like deep roots are in where did that a love for that come and what was your journey to where you are now sort of i, I yeah i mean i, I got interest interested in astronomy which, which you know I've, I've i've diversified a little bit into science in general and stem subjects um, more generally as well so science technology engineering math when i was about 10 years old and i, I was tagged not kicking and screaming but i was i was kind of dragged by my dad to a local astronomy society when i was 10 uh and i I, you know i don't recall having any real interest (laughs) in stargazing or astronomy at the time Um, but when we were there i remember we were were shown into what was you know i guess it's sort of a an archetypal astronomy club um and we were shown into this telescope or this observatory big domed building with a clockwork driven mount uh so you actually had this sort of crazy looking almost sort of um, you have these kind of images of uh, of crazy scientific laboratories having sort of wind up devices and <laughs> test tubes bubbling away. It kind of felt a little bit like that. Um, and I got shown into this observatory with a telescope in it, and we saw Saturn through wow. this telescope. And do you know what? That was it was a real turning point for me. I'd seen uh, telescopes, uh, so I'd seen uh, the images of Saturn books and, and on TV before that, of course, but seeing it for real through a telescope where the and i, I can almost see it today i can remember seeing a, a sort of a velvety black background um sky uh, and i saw the rings of saturn for real and, and it was the most amazing view um and it, you know that was the real spark that ignited me getting interested in science uh, and it's kind of kind of taken me on a, a journey to get me here today I've never really heard of a uh, like an astronomy club before. It sounds really interesting. Do those sort of things still exist today? Oh, crikey. Yeah, they, they, I mean, there are loads of every city in, in the UK, um, and I'm sure bar none, have got a, a handful of astronomy societies and clubs where people who are interested in astronomy will meet up. They, they can range from uh, people who just get together in village halls through to societies where they've got their own land, they've got their own observatory, um, my local astronomy society, the Norwich Astronomical Society, has got a, it's got a two-acre plot of land in South Norfolk. Um, it's got, I think, a couple of, of of observatories with with permanently mounted telescopes inside them. So they range massively, but all of them, uh, and again, I'm sure bar none, are all very welcoming to people who are interested in astronomy, 
to go along, have a look through whatever telescopes are there and, you know, share the love of the night sky. And it's a brilliant way, if people are interested in, in, in astronomy, it's a brilliant way for people to get into it and, uh, you know, and seek some local advice. Did you um, study any of the STEM subjects at all, go at either school or university? Do you know, I, I, I didn't. I, I went very much went down the amateur route. So I, I, I studied, you know, I f- studied physics at um, GCSE level. Um, and that, that's kind of as far as my my kind of uh, education went um i was i was my family never really did the whole academic thing so i went down the route of uh, getting out into industry and i i, I had met i tried many different careers even trained as an airline pilot for <laughs> for a oh, period wow. of time but that that coincided with the 9-11 um uh events so i qualified just after that um and trying to get work as a as a, an airline pilot which is you know it was really difficult because airline pilots were being laid off um across the industry so um i qualified never got any work um and it was around then that i started doing some work with the one show and, and my my media career then took off so i went very much went down the route of um uh, of amateur astronomy and of course astronomy in particular has got its roots in um amateur astronomy so I've, I've done a lot of work since then with with universities and got involved in research projects since um but my career took you know quite a diverse route to to, to get to where i am today so did you study some sort of uh, media or, or something like that initially no not no no not at all i mean there again you know my my uh, my arrival in this industry that i find myself in was where I, you know, and I, I was very lucky enough to be um, given an honorary doctorate from my local university a couple of oh, years wow. back. Oh, wow, congratulations. Um, uh, th- thank you very much. Um, and that, that was in recognition of all my work in media, um, not just local, but national, and around uh, sharing my love of science and trying to inspire and get other people interested, especially young people, get young people interested in, in, in science in general. Um, and so I, I kind of... I found myself in a career where I hadn't necessarily trained for being in that career, interestingly. But what I did do is I, I kept and I was always had one eye on opportunity. And I think that that was the that was the, the, the real lesson that I'd learned in all of my sort of route through my careers to get where I am today. You know, I did a lot of work for local media, um, voluntary work where, where there was local media work. There was interest in STEM subjects and I would, I would be very happy to spend time you know my own time more often than not on uh, on local radio local tv to you know without without pay to, to to just spread the love of science um and it was through through that that i got seen um by the one show and ultimately ended up you know carving out a career in in science broadcasting so it you know it's, it was a real lesson an eye-opener that whilst you don't necessarily need to be uh trained or go through special particular qualifications you know it, it was a real it was a real great example of opportunity presenting itself and i took it um and you know here i am today i love that i, re- I really love that because you know people will certainly i relate to myself you know i i really enjoy science and i love all the different aspects of it and you know engineering and and even mm. like history and things like that yep. and i i never went to university i decided to go straight out into work but mm. I, you know, I really, really do enjoy these these other subjects, and for you to have taken that love and then turned it into mm. a career is is amazing, and really, you know, um, a very cool thing to have done. But these yeah. these days that you're doing this now, um, you know, you said mentioned working on the one show, you did Stargazing Live, which was brilliant, by the way, really enjoyed that. But what's an average day like for you? Oh, do you know, it, more recently, it's it's become more of a diverse thing because with probably the, the the vast proportion of my income um of late has been through theater shows so i i was i i I, lo- I I published my first book uh when was it now gosh it was quite i don't know quite maybe about eight or nine years ago now um and it was called a down-to-earth guide to the cosmos and off the back of that i had some uh, book tour lined up where i took uh, a theater show uh, sort of a a, a lecture out around bookshops, um, around festivals, literary festivals, um, the Royal Institution in London. And it also took me to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, where the Edinburgh Fringe Festival is very well known for comedy. But yeah, over the say. years, they've been trying to diversify a little bit and trying to take it more into the spoken word market. So I took my uh, 
my my book over to the Edinburgh Festival, um, Fringe Festival, uh, like you know when it was published back back in eight nine years ago. Uh, and when I was there, I, I, I realised that there was a uh, there was a real market for for science content in theatres. Mm. And so I, I, I constructed this show and I particularly was interested in, in getting kids interested in science. So I created this show in hindsight. It, it seemed like a great concept on paper, but it was, it just didn't work. You know, you try these things. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, if people are interested in getting in the media, it's, it's a real, you know, you've got to be pretty hard, thick skinned about it because sometimes you get knockbacks sometimes things just don't work my first you know my my first sort of sort of trip into theater shows for kids and i certainly don't class myself as a kids entertainer but my first sort of experience was a show that i i created called uh, space cadets and it was just a massive flop and i <laughs> you know I, I learned a lot from that experience it was kind of a a fusion of a a lecture but with a few science experiments but at the same time that that very same year i went to the edinburgh fringe i got my kids up there with me with family uh and i took them to see the bubble man now the bubble man just spends an hour essentially just blowing bubbles uh, <laughs> and he was selling out his show every single day at the edinburgh fringe festival and i thought my goodness you know i want a little bit of that so i um i constructed this show called the spectacular science show which was just an hour of science experiments and so, and it went really, really well, and it sold out nearly every single show, which was brilliant. And I so I'd really come across a formula that worked to get kids interested in in science. But since then, of course, um, my the show has been going for, you know from strength to strength. I've been touring at theatres around the country for the last sort of four or five years now. But since the lockdown has happened, that's all gone out the window. So my my sort of average day. Well, I mean, I, I don't have an average day anymore. You know, before lockdown, it would be I would either be taking my theatre show out to theatres, you know, spending a couple of weeks on the road. Um, I could then be spending some time writing uh, articles for magazines. I could be uh, heading off down to London because there's a, a new story that Good Morning Britain want to cover about, you know, space or some kind of science item. So, you know, it, it really one day is not the same from to the next day. Uh, and, and now it's a little bit more subdued because theatre shows aren't happening at the moment. I've been putting the show online so that it can be enjoyed by uh, people wanting to watch it online. But also I've been, you know, trying to look at new ways to engage with audiences. So I'm working on um, some new podcast ideas. The new podcast that I launched just in the last few months called The Pocket Astronomer has been going really, really well. So it's been working on scripts for that, recording that, you know, no day, <laughs> there, there is no such thing as an average day for me. Um, but I like that, you know, I like that because it's, it, it's, it's flexible. It keeps me on my toes. Um, and I like the variability, you know, the, the, the nine to five thing for me, I find that very difficult to deal with. So having the flexibility of, of or the variability that I have in, in, in the world of media, you know, it whilst it's it's emotionally perhaps it's very tiring because you just don't know what's next necessarily, but at the same time it's very exciting. What do you think is some of the better ways to educate um, amateurs on some of the STEM subjects? Obviously, you've worked uh, through books, media, uh, live shows. What's what sort of um, do you think the best way to get younger people into the STEM subjects? Do you know, I, I think it's interesting. There's, there's, there's been a, there's, there's definitely been a switch and a change in the way that uh, information gets delivered these days. And we've noticed it in public, in, in publishing. Um, so, in, you know, in books, we've noticed it in TV uh, uh, commissioning. Uh, I, I think what, what, what people want these days, and it's becoming more and more common is people want bite-sized chunks of information and i think about you know i think about my kids for example uh, now they're nine and eleven um so you know th they're the younger than the sort of the audience that you're talking about but but i think you know i think that that's still being seen these days and i think what people want the now is they want bite-sized chunks of information people don't want to sit down and watch a 30 minute or an hour long tv documentary as much anymore what they seem to want is five minute chunks of information and you can see that in social media platforms yeah. where you've got the likes of instagram and the likes of uh tiktok it's it's all bite-sized chunks of information and people almost can't sit down and watch an hour-long show anymore or don't want to sit down and watch an hour-long show anymore they just want bits of information and i think that's where 
that's where you know the world of education um and or rather it's, i think it's called um edutainment i think it's called now and i think that's that's the route that that we need to go down now where the information is still presented the you know, same stuff the same information the same scientific information is being uh given out to the, you know being broadcast to people but it's in bite-sized chunks and i think that's that's the direction we need to go to reach the younger audience now it's really interesting you say that because we actually had the uh, producer and director of the Carwell YouTube channel on recently, and they've oh, got yeah. about five over five million subscribers. And she said mm. the exact same thing: people literally have no attention span anymore. They no. want content that's so quick and to the point yeah. and, and entertaining. Mm. Like mm. like you say, I don't really sit down and watch TV. Jules, do you sit no, down? Watching? Not so much these days. No. No. So it, it is all about fast content and high quality mm. content. I think. It is. And, you know, giving my age away, you know, going back in the day when I was younger, um, <laughs> you know, I, I had to rely on a TV schedule. You know, there, there was no such thing as as Netflix or YouTube. Um, if you want to watch your favorite program, you had to wait until it was on the television. Um, you know, and that you know, I try and explain that to my children. And it's like you have to wait for your TV show <laughs> instead. Now, you know, you can just you can blast through every single episode because it's all on Netflix or it's all on whatever the channel is the, the medium that it's on and you know people don't want to sit down and, and you know largely i think that's our lifestyles these days doesn't allow people to sit down uh, and watch a full yeah. hour of something people want stuff chunked up um and so yeah it's interesting i'm glad to hear they said the same thing as me though it's a relief yes <laughs> um what would be some of the personality traits uh you've seen yourself and other broadcasters around you maybe uh, slightly more towards the the stem side of things in broadcasting um that you think help help you succeed mm, i think definitely uh i mean certainly being confident is is a really key part of it you know you've you've got to be comfortable and I'm, i remember the very first time i did some filming for the one show i'd done stuff for local media before uh and that was kind of okay but when i did stuff for the one show for the first time i was in the in the center of norwich actually my own hometown um, it was a, I think it was a Friday or a Saturday night, and we were in the city centre doing some uh, some vox popping, so going out asking members of the public questions about science. Um, and it was in the middle of town, and I had these cameras on me, and I had lights <laughs> on, and sound, you know, ca- uh, record, uh, camera guys there, sorry, sound guys there. So it was really obvious that you know we were doing something, and you have you've got to be really comfortable having people looking at you. It sounds really silly, but you know it's one thing to be confident but it's something completely different to stand there and have everyone watch you doing what you're doing. And so you've got to be really, really super confident about things. So I think that's a really important trait, but also if you, you know, to, to, to get into media uh, and especially in the world of STEM subjects, I think it's, you've, you've got to have thick skin and you've got to be tenacious. And the reason I say that is because with, with the advent of, of social media everyone wants to now be a science broadcaster or stem broadcaster or everyone you know everyone's got access to decent cameras through the phones everyone can stream live whereas before you know that that was the world of 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 tv companies but now anyone can do it so you've got to be tenacious you've got to be imaginative and you know you've got to be thick-skinned because if you want to get into it as a career you know you will get knockbacks whoever you are you will get knockbacks but you know you can't take them personally you've got to just pick yourself up and crack on and get on to the next project um so i think confidence yeah you know really confident know your subject as well because if you don't there will definitely be people who do know your subject uh don't you know don't try and blag it because people will find you out absolutely but also pick a subject that you're passionate about passion is a really important part of how you come over on on camera or or on a podcast uh, or even in, in your writing style so confidence passionate uh, um, tenacious and be really thick-skinned as well because you know say you'll get knockbacks but you know you keep keep plugging away at it and i'm sure you'll get there and what would be some of the biggest positives or opportunities you've had out of this uh, career so far yeah I, you know i've done some amazing things and you know I, i've i've been on uh trips so I, i'm through, through all the work that i do i'm i'm the one of the ambassadors for bernardo's one a wonderful uh oh, wow. charity kids charity um we've done some brilliant uh, fundraising events i've been I've, i went on a uh, a climb of mount uh, borneo uh, in what's it called now mount kiliman not kiliman 
Kinabalu, that's it in Borneo. So we went up uh, Mount uh, Kinabalu, forgot the, the, the name, but again, <laughs> that was an amazing experience. Went up with some people from Taui um, and enjoyed some really amazing dark skies when we were up there. Um, I went on a trip to the Arctic as well, again with, with Bernardo's. Um, I did some, we did some filming for Stargazing Live. I was on the, uh, I think it's the English Channel, went on this boat across the English Channel to do some a video about uh, navigating by the stars. That was wonderful. I can remember being on the sea on this fairly small boat. Um, the sky was a beautiful kind of lilac colour as the sun set and we were looking at Venus and we were measuring our, our latitude using sextants and things. Uh, I went down a salt mine in North Yorkshire for the one show, doing some filming about dark matter detecting. Do you know, oh, wow. there, there's been some wonderful, wonderful experiences. Um, I also remember going up to uh, Galloway Forest up in uh, up near Glasgow for the one show. And, do you know, it's amazing. There's a lot of work for very little return. We, we Obviously, being based in Norfolk, where I am, it was a, a good journey of about 11 hours to get up there through the train and then a cab ride and then another train it took a good 11 hours to get there then we filmed for most of the night uh stayed overnight and then you know another 11 hour journey home and, uh, and off the back of all that we've got about five minutes of tv so there's wow. you, know, you have to put in sometimes you have to put in an awful lot of work uh and there doesn't seem to be an awful lot out of it but you know it, it is the most wonderful experience and what i must say about people who seem who, who work in media is that there are lots of really wonderful people, especially, you know, the guys behind the scenes, you know, you've got to get on with people. Yeah. Um, and the people I work with in theatres, on TV shows, from, you know, everyone who's involved in TV shows, it's a great, great camaraderie. And, you know, and, and that's one of the, the really great benefits for me is that you meet a lot of really wonderful people. And on the, uh, the other side of that, what are some of the less favourable aspects of the, uh, the industry? I... <laughs> I think, again, the knockbacks, because you do get knockbacks, you have got to learn that it's not a personal thing. You know, it, it might just be that your face doesn't fit, but actually, you know, especially TV work, it, it is about, <laughs> sounds terrible, but it's about what you look like and whether you, you know, represent the audience or the, the kind of the demographic that the audience are, are looking at. Um, so, you know, you, you can't you can't take things personally at all. Otherwise, you know, you won't get on very far. You've got to be... Um, you know reasonable about about accepting the fact that just sometimes you're not the right person for the job um, the hours are not sociable you know I can often get a phone call at 10 o'clock at night say there's a news item that's breaking that I need to get down to London for good morning Britain for the following day um, not so much now because everything's you know kind of across zoom calls or, or, or uh, kind of remote interviews but certainly normally it's it, it can be very unsociable hours um, and, you know, you've, you've got to say yes a lot because if you say no, then they'll start picking someone else. So, you know, you've got to make yourself available. It can be on social hours. It can involve a lot of traveling, a lot of being away from home. So, that, you know, there are downsides, but those downsides can also give you lots of ups. So, you know, Edinburgh Fringe, for example, I take my science show up there every year, normally spend a good month up there away from the family, which is a downside. But by the same token... I meet some really wonderful people. I get to meet and get, you know, really friendly with a new bunch of people. So I've got some very good friends now that I've met through the Edinburgh Fringe. So there are downsides, but, you know, I'm a very positive, optimistic person. There's lots of, of those negative experiences where you can get positives out of them. We like to talk a little bit about uh, what people could expect uh, salary wise. So we, we go away and for some stats and we do average incomes um, and broadcasting, as you can imagine, was, was pretty hard to find any sort of reliable figures. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, the averages came out between 20 and 30,000 a year. But as I'm sure you'll tell us, that's probably it can vary wildly. It can, you know, one year can be, it's, it's so, so, so difficult and it, it depends who it is, you know. And you can't always put a, f a financial figure on it, you know, doing, doing work with Bernardo's, um, you know, we, we did um, the Arctic trip, for example, there was actually quite a lot of publicity around that. So that, you know, there's, there's benefits that aren't necessarily financial because you, you know, you can do some work um, for a charity or for something else. And whilst you might not get a lot of money out of it, um, you can get quite a lot of publicity out of it. So it's, it's, it is so difficult. And I, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not skirting around the question because it's it's so so difficult. My yeah. income from yeah. one year to the next can vary wildly. This year is mm. going to be a very low income year because um, you know all my theatre shows have got cancelled for the most part of this year. So you know theatre is a big part of my income, but 
it's it's so 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 difficult there you can get book deals for example you know you can get a book deal that can be anything from five thousand pounds upwards depending on what you know what the book is and uh, you know and that's that's just a uh, a value to write the book and you know publishing is a, is a great example where um it's not a, a simple number because with uh, with a book publication deal you'll get a most uh, publication deals you'll get a cash advance to write the book um but then you'll get royalties off the back of any book sales now whether you get a, a high cash advance and a low set of royalties or a low cash advance and a high set of royalties will depend entirely on how popular the publishers think the book's going to be so you know there are so so many variables yeah you know an income from 20,000 upwards is probably a good gauge and you know the upwards bit can be um you know it can it can be to 25,000 or if you're someone like I don't know you know a top a class tv personality you know that can be up in the hundred thousands yeah of course and um what would be something that's uh, not in the job description or that you uh, have to deal with that you probably didn't expect to uh crikey, what's not in the job description that you have to deal with I, uh, do you know i think i would probably say uh probably the, the interaction with the public i think is probably a really good one because you you just can't you you can never be sure certainly if you get into you know get into the world of media you, you you can probably think deal with publishers deal with producers directors uh theater crew you know all that sort of stuff you can kind of expect that but then off the back of all of that you've then got the, the sort of the public persona um that you have to deal with and that that can be anything from i mean i remember particularly uh i was doing some uh, uh piece for good morning britain i forget what it was about now but i was up in edinburgh filming in edinburgh and we were waiting to go on air and there was this guy who was drunk and he's actually early in the morning as well which was which was quite <laughs> worrying but then i suppose it was scotland um the uh, he he was uh, he was he, he he'd had a bit to drink and and he was quite quite annoying and and getting quite leery um so it, it was very much a case of having to and it, you know because i was front of camera he was I was the person he focused on. You're kind of good at dealing with people. Now I spent special constable volunteering my time to be a, to be a voluntary policeman. So you know, I like to think actually I'm quite good at dealing with people. So <laughs> I think actually dealing with the public is okay. is, is is the uh, the the thing that's not on the job description. Where you, you know you could either be filming or talking to kids after a science show or. Um, interacting with people on social media, I think that you know that's the bit that actually it takes it, take, it takes a little bit of thought and a bit and probably a little bit of skill to know how to deal with people. And I think that's probably the you know be that if you feel in the middle of filming or if you're you know, in a theatre show or, or just interacting on social. I think d- dealing with 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 the general public, you know, and people who want to engage with you, um, I think that's the bit that I never really expected. And suddenly it kind of hit me as oh wow yeah this is actually you need to think about this. And have you got any advice or tips for anyone that wants to? Once they're in the industry, you start progressing. Yeah, I think I'd said about don't give up, and I think that's probably the biggest, the biggest thing for me is 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 don't give up. Um, what you know, whatever you're doing, you've got to be really, really careful about um, your career progression. You've always got to say yes to any. Well, most opportunities, you've really, really got to say yes to them because. It, you know if you start saying no to you know to like a news tv news company for example there's a good chance they'll start asking someone else so i think you know try to say yes to everything you can say yes to um as long as it doesn't go against your personal values of course um and i think as well don't take any knockbacks personally because you know you will get them throughout the career um and, and it's really important that that you, you that any any knockbacks you might get you don't you know you grow from them you learn what what the knockback was for why you got the knockback and then try and develop that and, and take it into turn it into a strength. And uh, would you still go into the industry knowing everything that you know now? Absolutely. A hundred times. Yet yeah, I think Brilliant. it's hard work. Um, it, you know, like I said, it takes, it can take you away from the family. It's, uh, but it, it, the, the positives that are, they're, they're wonderful. They're great. You know, every single experience I've had has been, a, has been a positive experience. It even, you know, even if, my, you know, a book proposal got turned down, the book proposals actually turned out to be a better one as a result of that. So yeah, of course I would, you know, it, it, it's an amazing industry. It's hard work. You don't ever have uh, a regular schedule, but it's, but it's great. It keeps you on your toes. And yeah, like, like I said before, you meet some great people 
Um, and yeah, you, you can have some really great times as well. Thank you so much for coming on, Mark. It's been really fascinating to hear all about your career and um, I hope the theatres open up soon for you so people can get back and enjoy your show. Yeah, do you know, I, I really miss a live audience. It's great doing things on Zoom. You know, I've done a few Zoom sort of bits and pieces, but it's not the same as standing on a stage in front of loads of people. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much for that. It's been great. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, where can people find you on social media as well as your podcast and other bits? Yes, yeah, sure. yes. So the podcast is called The Pocket Astronomer. Um, just search for that. You'll find it on, on, on the various different uh, platforms for podcasts i've got a website two websites actually mark thompson astronomy.com which is all my general stuff um you can find all the details of the podcast on there anyway uh, and then the spectacular science show.com as well but i am on twitter as astronomer underscore mark um if you and the same on on uh, instagram as well so you find me there and uh, very happy to uh, to engage with people of course brilliant thank you so much for coming on thanks mark it's been a pleasure cheers guys Bye-bye. bye bye bye